Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation. Tonight, we are joined by biologist and Montgomery County Speakers Bureau member Clarence Hickey as he teaches us how he raises monarch caterpillars in his very own home and backyard and then releases them into the wild. Reminder, please remain muted during the presentation. As always, there will be an opportunity at the end to unmute for a Q&A. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, make sure to check out our website, PoolsvilleSeniors.org, and register to join us again next week. Without further ado, Clarence, take it away. Thank you, Donnie. I very much appreciate that. Uh, just a, maybe a just a little uh, opener thing here. I'd like to, can I share my screen? Is that okay? Yes. Let me make sure it's all set. I have a dialog box saying it's disabled. Okay, so go ahead and try now. There we go. So we'll start right here. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, terrific. Well, it's really nice to, to be with you. To and I, I want to thank the Poolsville seniors, all of you, and uh, Dottie for making this happen and for the privilege of sharing uh, some information with you, sharing you, we'll talk with you about my friends. The monarch butterflies are my friends. And I think uh, we're all staying in now. So maybe this is a, a nice topic on a cool night to do us thinking about the, the nice weather again and how we can get, get back outside and do some really useful things. So I thank the Poolsville seniors. And I want to thank uh, Montgomery History as well, the Montgomery History, uh, Montgomery County Historical Society here in Maryland. Uh, you guys in Poolsville will understand where that is. Maybe our North Carolina friend uh, maybe is, is not quite picturing this. So Montgomery County in Maryland is, is uh, borders on Washington, D.C., and then goes to the north, not quite as far as Baltimore, but the, a nice, uh, nice uh, large portion uh, of Maryland. So what I'd like to do here today this is what I propose we will do. It looks like a lot, but I, it really isn't. And I may skip around a little bit with uh, what we talk about today. I'll talk a little bit about monarchs and their migration. This butterfly that migrates uh, the length of, just about the length uh, of, of our, uh, our hemisphere here, not, not quite, but uh, in North America. And talk about the growing milkweed and some flowers and other things, which I have in my yard. And I've got lots of colorful slides to show you here. And then a bit about the, the life cycle of the monarch from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis uh, to uh, adult butterfly. And I'll talk to you a bit about the, the uh, monarchs uh, in the wild in my backyard uh, and then moving some inside and why I did that. And you'll see here I'm using the word uh, chrysalides. Now, some people say chrysalises, that's fine too. I think chrysalides just slides off the tongue a little easier. And, and uh, so both of those are, are correct terms. Uh, and I'll show you, actually, I have a couple of brief videos uh, embedded uh, in my slides here that, to help you understand a little bit of that. And then I'll talk about releasing butterflies, as our friend in North Carolina did this year. Uh, I began a tagging program as a citizen scientist. Now, I'll, I'll explain that. Some of the sources of mortality that the monarchs face, and then some things about what you and I can do and, and some resources. So this is the, the subject of our gathering tonight. I want to try to, I, I like the, this feature of PowerPoint that allows you to do this. You get a nice view of this beautiful animal. This was one of the, the releases I did a couple of years ago, actually, in my backyard. I release them out where I found them, where I found the eggs and caterpillars is where I go out and release the butterflies. So this is a, a schematic on the migration of this incredible animal that seems so delicate. This butterfly that seems so delicate is really quite tough and quite hardy. And their overwintering place is down here in central Mexico, up in the high hills among the fir trees uh, and, and uh, some acres there where they gather in the winter. They're there right now. They, they would, this would be their time for being in their, their home place uh, overwintering uh, in Mexico. Then come springtime, usually March or so, 
they begin the northerly migration. The northerly migration shows the with the uh, green arrows going from, from Mexico uh, up through the central US from the Rocky Mountains to the East Coast, going into Northern Canada to the just over the border of Canada. The range of monarchs is the range of milkweed and milkweed range ranges into Southern Canada where you can see the kind of the line here. And so they, during the, the springtime in March, they'll, they'll, they'll arrive up in the US in April or so and keep going, get up into Canada. And on this northerly migration, they will spawn, spawn, reproduce four or five times. One, one uh, um, adult will, leave, will uh, live two to six weeks and they'll fly and they'll stop, they'll find the milkweed, they'll lay the eggs and those eggs will, will hatch, become caterpillars, become adults. Off they'll go for a while and do it again. And it'll take four or five of those reproductive cycles for the monarch to reach its north, the northern part of its range. And then in the, in the summer, the latter summer, they begin the southerly migration back home to Mexico. And that's when I have been seeing them here uh, in Maryland, beginning usually in the latter August and early September. Uh, they, they, they come through this area. They uh, come through the, my, my little monarch, my, my, my milkweed forest in my backyard. Uh, and lay their eggs there. And I'll, I'll show you more about that. But this is just another little schematic showing you the same thing um, in talking about the milkweed. You know, without milkweed, there are no monarchs. And the uh, reduction in uh, milkweed along their migratory route is one of the reasons that they're having some difficulties. Uh, but then there's also, the, and this, this line right here represents the Rocky Mountains, a really high country. And so the monarchs, that we see are, are in this group over here that go between Mexico and Canada. And there's also a, a population that, that uh, overwinters on the California coast. Uh, and, and they're apparently very numerous in some places. And they move around back and forth uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. We can come back to this if you have questions later, we can certainly do that. This is a photo that was taken by a friend of mine, a biologist I know, uh, who lives on Long Island, New York. In fact, let me go back. Long Island, New York is right here. This is New York State. This is Long Island. And this photograph was taken here out on the eastern end where the monarchs have been, when they're migrating south, a group of them comes over uh, Long Island and goes down the coast. So this is what it looks like. Uh, as they're in beginning that southern migration, they roost at night. They don't fly at night. They fly during the day when it's warm and they roost at night. And they seem to like uh, evergreens, pine trees, which is what their population does in the highlands uh, in Mexico. So that's just pretty neat. I don't see them like this here, but my friend does. And he keeps me informed here. We, we share information back and forth. Well, this is in my backyard. And this is what the milkweed looks like when it's starting to come up. Uh, it begins to, to appear in my yard in April. And it comes up in a really easy, little short, short stubby things. It almost looks like asparagus when it's first coming up. Then it begins to leaf and it's very succulent. So here they are, one is about a, about a, foot, a foot tall. You can see several other of them back here. I planted them in what was my vegetable garden maybe five or six years ago. Uh, and the milkweed came up and took over the vegetable garden. It's now expanded out beyond that into other areas of the yard. It really needs to be managed uh, or it would just really take over your yard. So I managed some of it last year when it was getting, getting going, going too far away and I trimmed a bit of it and I planted some new ones in another spot. But the once, once, they, once they get going, they're pretty easy. They're perennials. You don't have to do anything with them, but, but let them grow. And this is what they'll get to be. This is a, a piece of, what, of my garden in the, in the uh, late spring, early summer. These plants get really tall. They get five or five to six feet tall with big leaves. And they grow these nice groups of flowers that, that hang down. And then as the, the, the flowers start lower on and as you work up the plant, there are the, the younger flowers. And this one, up, these up on the top here have not opened yet, but they're, they're very numerous. Uh, they're very pretty and they're very, very fragrant. 
this is what they look like up close. They really are quite a quite a pretty flower, a bundle of flowers. And one of the other nice things about these flowers is while they're growing and you're awaiting the the, the butterflies to come through and, and lay their eggs on your milkweed, uh, these these very fragrant flowers, rich in nectar, attract lots of insects. Lots of insects that we like, uh, like the honeybees and the bumblebees. Honeybees are not quite as numerous in my yard as they were some years ago, but I'm, I'm seeing a few. But bumblebees are seem to be what, what works really well in my backyard, pollinating whatever it is that needs to be pollinated. A lot of bumbles and other butterflies. Lots of other butterflies will come to this. This, I think, is a, is a zebra swallowtail, if I'm not mistaken. And it's just a very beautiful butterfly. Coming for a coming for a meal. Ah, and this one. Recognize this one. Where you have insects, insects galore, you will have praying mantis uh, as one of the uh, predators on, on insects. This one actually was uh, a young one, about oh maybe two inches long. They get to be three to four inches or more, uh, and they lose that green color and get a little bit of gray. And they're, they're, I, I welcome these guys in my yard. They'll take care of some of the pests. And then this year, this past year, 2021, uh, during the uh, springtime, during May and June primarily, my uh, milkweed plants did double duty. Before they actually uh, served the monarch butterflies, they served the 17-year periodical cicadas, which were very, very numerous where I live, just south of Rockville. In fact, I, I did some studies on these and estimated in, in, a, in my small backyard, I, based on the number of holes and things I saw in the yard, I estimated that in my little backyard, there could have been as many as 40,000 periodical cicadas there. So they were very numerous. And then after they, they were done uh, in the, uh, 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 about mid-July or so, uh, and then the, the, the milkweed continued to grow. And with milkweed plants, they bring some things with them. One of the things they bring with them, it seems, are, are a, a species of, of aphid. aphid. This, is, this is called the oleander aphid. And they can be very numerous at some point, and they, they also feed on the milkweed. And where you have aphids, you have uh, ladybird beetles, ladybugs. They are predators on aphids. So when you look at this photo here, you might see this aphid here may have a, a short lifespan. And then the thing that's very common uh, with milkweed are, are milkweed beetles. And there's a couple different uh, species of those. This is one. This is the, uh, uh, the milkweed bug. Uh, and you can see the, kind of the life stages here. This, this is the adult with the black head, the black tail, and the black bar across the middle, and then some of the younger ones, and then the very tiny, recently hatched ones. So with milkweed come milkweed beetles. They're pretty harmless, I think. Uh, they can they just kind of look like they get in the way, but they don't seem to have bothered the milkweed, nor do they seem to have bothered the, the, uh, the monarch's use of the milkweed. One of the other uh, insects that comes with, this is called the longhorn milkweed bug, milkweed beetle. You can see they've got these long antennae. And these aren't quite as numerous as the ones I just showed you, but these also are common on the milkweed. When you get milkweed, you get these beetles. So as the milkweed grows and that, that, that group pod of flowers matures and gets fertilized, the milkweed plant makes this pod of seeds that began with those fer the fertilization of those groups of flowers. And they get these nice green pods in the, in the latter summer. And in the, in the fall, the pod opens and the, the seeds are, are wind dispersed. So they're, they're carried by the wind. And so I happen to be, for better or worse, the neighbor who provides the neighborhood with the seeds dispersed by the wind. And this is, this is one of what I offer to the neighborhood. This is what the pods look like. I collect these pods from my plants and I, I treat them carefully. 
And I have for the last three or four years been, been giving pods out to people and friends uh, who would like to plant milkweed. And I've given a, a bunch of these out to some of the senior centers, actually, uh, here in uh, Montgomery County, where I've, I've done programs like this. So if any of any of the, the Poolsville seniors would like some milkweed pods to try to plant some milkweed and help the monarchs, I'll be glad to uh, package some up and get them to Dottie, I guess, who can then get them to you. One of the other things that happens in my yard, I don't use any chemicals, no, per no pesticides or herbicides, uh, no fertilizers. I just use what comes out of my compost pile. And one of the things that I, I get uh, not infrequently are these large thistle plants. And they are large, but they're also very, very pretty. And they also, it's hard to see here, these nice flowers are really good for the pollinators. They like those. But the seeds from these are also windborne. So this is one of those other things I offer to the neighborhood. But I get a lot of these coming up in my yard. And what I typically do is just cut them all back except for one or two, let one or two grow for the pollinators. And the other thing in my yard that you probably well recognize here that also makes this windboard seed, which little kids like to blow on, dandelion. And because I don't use any pesticides or herbicides, I get lots of different things coming up in my yard. I have tallied over time, not, not rigorously, but I have tallied that I share my yard, my space with at least 175 other life forms. And that includes plants and animals, things like this. Well, let's get on to the subject here. Uh, the monarch coming through uh, my yard uh, in the, Latter August and into September. And here's one that I managed to capture on a milkweed. This is a female monarch laying an egg on the underside of the milkweed, the leaf, which is typically what they do. Typically the eggs are on the undersides of the leaf. I've seen them on the top, but primarily they lay them on the underside. They're less visible. And they're more protected from the weather. And that's where, you, where I'll find the eggs. Uh, and that, and when I, after I'm watching these uh, monarchs, come through my yard and look like they're laying eggs. When they're done and leave, I'll go out and survey what's happened. And when I find, excuse me, when I find leaves that have eggs on them, I'll mark that plant with a, a stake or something so I can watch it. And this is what the egg looks like. It's very, this isn't a very good picture, but it's really, really tiny. And it's kind of football shaped conical. And it's about the size of a grain of salt. Between the size of a grain of salt and a small grain of rice. They're very tiny. And they'll, they'll grow on the egg for three to five days uh, before the very, very tiny caterpillar uh, hatches. And it is really tiny, like a tenth of an inch long. It's extremely small. And the first thing the caterpillar does when it bursts its way out, chews its way out of the egg, it turns around and it eats the egg case. That's the first bit of nutrition that this new caterpillar has. Not only does that give it a little bit of nutrition, but it kind of removes the evidence of where the caterpillar, where, where it grew. But the, these, these little caterpillars tend to eat in a circle. But another one of the ways that I find these little tiny caterpillars on the undersides of leaves, so I'll go out in the garden and, and scan and look, look on the leaves for this sort of a semicircular pattern of what's been eaten, and then turning the leaf over, it's not uncommon to find this little caterpillar there. This is, this is what they do when they're really tiny. And you can see when they're really tiny, they're not that colorful, like you might picture the adult. And they have really, really tiny antennae. And they will, as they grow to be the large caterpillar before they form the chrysalis, uh, about two weeks worth of growing, uh, they become more, uh, more colorful and they get longer uh, antennae uh, as they grow. They will molt their skin uh, four or five times during this life stage as they're growing a little larger. This one's probably molded once. It's getting a little more colorful, a little longer antennae. It's got some friends out here awaiting the uh, ladybird beetle. And this is a, where the caterpillar has been eating the milkweed. Milkweed is the only food source for these caterpillars. It's the only thing they live on. If there's no milkweed, there's no monarch caterpillars. And here's one that's, it's probably an inch long or so, getting a little more colorful and getting longer antennae. 
And one of the things that milkweed does for these caterpillars, it makes them toxic to being eaten by, by predators, uh, lots of different kinds of predators. And the toxicity in the caterpillar holds into the, uh, to the adult butterfly as well. But when they're really, really tiny for the first two molts or so, when they haven't eaten that much milkweed, they're not toxic and they can fall prey to whatever might be out there looking for them. And then this one here, you can see this one, this one I, was one that I had in, in, the, uh, in my refugia in my home, which I'll show you. This one just molted, just crawled out of this old skin here and is now very colorful and, and nearly, nearly a mature caterpillar. So they crawl out of their skin kind of like we envision a snake does. To grow, they have to shed the old skin to grow a little larger. And like a blue crab, you know, the blue crab has to get rid of that old hard shell in order to grow larger. And when it climbs out of that old shell is when we, we uh, know them as soft shell crabs. So this one has just shed the skin. And this one's probably nearly full grown. It's for, for a, a caterpillar. And they're about, about two inches long, plus or minus. This was out in my garden when I was surveying out there and found this nice, beautiful caterpillar. Aren't they wonderful? And it's this pattern of, of gold, white, and black, apparently, which uh, is, has some meaning for who might, whatever might be their predators. So leave them alone, because if you eat this, it might be toxic to you. Well, can you see the chrysalis here? Let me show you here. Here we go. Here's the chrysalis, the caterpillar forming the chrysalis on its way to becoming the adult butterfly. This is on the underside of a, uh, of a milkweed. This is very unusual. Typically, the uh, caterpillars do not form their chrysalides on the plants where they've been living, where, the, where they've been noticed. They typically climb down off the milkweed and crawl many feet, sometimes up to 30 or 40 feet, looking for another place to form, to, to become the chrysalis, find a, a good secure place, hopefully that's, somewhat protected to form the crystal. So this was a little unusual, but that's a nifty, nifty photo. Well, a couple of years ago, three or four years ago, I was monitoring the monarchs and the caterpillars in my yard. And I saw all these uh, uh, female butterflies laying eggs on the, on the milkweed. And I was finding very few uh, caterpillars as a result of that, very few. And I, I saw no adults as a result. So I started doing some research and talking to some folk, people I know. Turns out that the, the mortality rate uh, from egg to adult for the monarch is somewhere between 95 and 99%. So of all the eggs laid, between like one and 5% survive to adulthood. So I wasn't seeing survival in my yard for some reasons, which I'll show you. So I then decided, well, maybe, maybe I could bring some in and help them inside. And I went online and uh, ordered and, and, and purchased a butterfly net that took a few weeks to find me. Uh, so in, in between, I created my own kind of refugia area to help the, the caterpillars using a, a couple of buckets uh, and a, a little small layer of water in the bottom. And the, the, the kind of foam that you use, I put a hole in it and I cut a, a, a sprig of a milkweed, put it down in there, down into the water with some rocks around it in the tub, and then put some sticks around and some, some netting. This is the kind of netting that, that came from uh, um, something from the supermarket was in here, some fruits or vegetables. So I'm, I'm repurposing that to make a temporary cage for the caterpillars. And this was, this was some of the caterpillars in that cage that I created. All the photos and videos you'll see here tonight were all done with my cell phone. You too can do this. We might see, this is a brief video, we might see here who turns out to be the alpha caterpillar. So there's actually several in here. I actually ended up getting some more buckets and spread them out a little bit. 
seemed like maybe this was a little too dense for them. But there's about six different six caterpillars in here. And these are all pretty, pretty near uh, mature, pretty near the time when they will start uh, forming the chrysalis. Who do you think is the alpha caterpillar? I think we found out. And here's what they do for two weeks, three to five days as an egg. They hatch from the egg and they spend about two weeks uh, as a caterpillar. And their job as a caterpillar is to do this for two weeks. So in my, my artificial refugia in my tubs, uh, the, the advice is that you clean it out every day, because as you can see down here, this is what uh, is is properly called the frass, caterpillar poop. They eat a lot and they do a lot of this. So I was cleaning these cages out every day and providing new fresh leaves to help these guys do as, as best, the, best they could. And this is what it looked like inside that cage. Uh, the caterpillars, after about two weeks or so, they stop eating and they start wandering. They're wandering around looking for a place to form that chrysalis, like I showed you with the one that was in the in my garden. Um, what is this? Okay. Um, and so th they started wandering around through here, and some of them went up to the netting. Some of them went to the, the wooden sticks I put in there to begin to attach themselves and then form the chrysalis. And they, they'll wander around, and when they find that perfect spot, they'll stop, and they'll begin to, to excrete this gluey substance to help them attach to this place. And then they'll hang upside down in this J shape. And the scientists call this a uh, J hanging. So this is a J hanger, getting ready to shed this skin and form the chrysalis. It's not a cocoon. Some uh, caterpillars and, and butterflies and moths form cocoons around themselves, but the chrysalis is actually part of the animal, and I'll show you that. So here's a couple of chrysalides that uh, have been formed, and the, the chrysalides uh, hang like this while, the, while the, the animal inside metamorphoses from anywhere from like 10 to 13 days. And this is what it looks like. I might speed this up just a little. But this is one of the uh, J hangers that is beginning to shed the skin, shed that old colorful skin to form the green chrysalis. Now let's let's watch this for just a minute. Is this all coming through okay, Dottie? Yep, looks good. Okay, thank you. So I might speed this up just a little and you'll see what happens. And you can watch as this skin moves its way up as the animal sheds it. And it's a very active time. It takes a lot of movement to do this, there it goes. And pretty soon, this almost chrysalis is gonna decide that it doesn't need that old skin anymore. Oop, let me do that again. There it goes. Now I had a, a caterpillar escaped from my, my uh, tent here and I had no idea where it was uh, in, in, in my downstairs. And I was looking, 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 never found it. I thought, well, maybe, maybe it's formed a chrysalis someplace. But what I found uh, on, down on the, on, the, on the deck was that skin that had been dropped. So looking up from there, I found the chrysalis. This is what it looks like up close and personal after it's dropped the skin and it's being sure that it is firmly attached so that it can spend the next 10 or 12 or 13 days metamorphosing and maturing. Uh, so my butterfly cage arrived and it took over a portion of my family room for a few weeks. And it's a really nice cage. Uh, 
with a, a big door that opens, unzips here, and a, a nice case and, and fully breathes. You can look in here, see what I what I did at this point. This was when I had those caterpillars in that artificial tent I made. I transferred them into here with some of the ones that were attached to the sticks, and I just attached them using magnets and other things. So here I've got several chrysalides all forming, getting ready uh, to, to become something else. And this is up close and personal. A chrysalis, it's about, about one inch long, very tiny, but very colorful with uh, uh, bright spots around it. And this is this is part that's called the cremaster, and it's it's what attaches the chrysalis to the substrate up here. It's very cool. So after about uh, oh no, about ten or eleven days or so, when it's getting to the point where it's almost ready to emerge, it does this. It turns dark. And the first time I saw one of these do this a few years ago in my butterfly zone, I went, oh no, I killed it. But this is. But that's, I did not. What you see happening here is this. You can see through there what's going on inside and what's about to happen. This miracle that is about to happen. This thing that was a crawly thing outside now is going to do this. I'm going to play this whole thing. It's about two minutes long. And the, the little butterfly has chewed its way out of, the, out of there. It's still hanging upside down, just like when it was that upside down caterpillar. And you'll see it's going to, it's still holding on in there and it's going to release itself up here in just a bit. And you'll see what happens. There we go. I feel like we need a drum roll or something here. I'm not sure. Or trumpets in the background. Isn't that magnificent? Oh my, oh my. And you'll see that the feeding tube here is actually in two parts when it hatches, when it comes out of there. And what this, this young fellow is doing here is exercising this and he's getting it so that the two parts come together to form like a straw. They meld together to form that drinking tube, the proboscis drinking tube that the adult butterfly will need to, to get nectar from flowers. And if this if this feeding tube does not coalesce together, then the butterfly won't be able to, to uh, drink. So what's happening here now is when they first emerge, their abdomen is, is very, very fat. This is where all the fluids are that are right now being pumped into the wings to help the wings expand. So this young butterfly is going to hold on to the chrysalis. Sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll move around a bit and, and grab onto the netting to hold on to this chrysalis for Oh, two or three or four hours or so. Ah, wow, look, the tube is functioning there. Looks like it's working. And they'll start pumping the fluid into the into the wings. So this butterfly needs uh, Mr. Newton's gravity to help here. And I had actually had one like this in my big cage uh, this last year, lost its grip and fell. And I had the, the floor of it with some soft materials there just in case. This never had happened, but this one fell. Fortunately, I was in the room at the time and I went in, opened the cage and lifted and put it back up and let it get a good grip on, on the netting at the top. And, and it did, did very well. But that would be one of the sources of mortality out in nature. If the butterfly lost its grip and fell to the ground, uh, it probably wouldn't survive. The wings wouldn't, wouldn't uh, uh, develop naturally so it could fly. And that would be a source of mortality. Well, here's a couple of them in that cage that are, this one's a, a little newer than this one. This one, the wings are probably pretty much fully extended and they'll, they'll hang there uh, for three or four hours to do this. And the, the instructions that I received from those who know more than me was that uh, they should be released uh, within 24 hours. So that's what I've done. I've, I've monitored when, when they have emerged and I make sure they, they are out before 24 hours so that they can have flying time and find food sources. Isn't that beautiful? And this is what's left behind when the butterfly is gone. I think that's, it looks like, kind of like a, an old space helmet from a, 
a 1950s black and white sci-fi movie? Something left behind. Evidence of the animal. Even if you never see it, you know it's been there. And this is what it looks like I, when you pull it off. There's this whole netting of, of that was a sticky material that the caterpillar used to attach to the wood or whatever, and so that the chrysalis could could adhere to here and be attached real firmly. It's really quite amazing. It's, it's almost very silk-like and very strong. It's, it's it's impressive. This delicate little animal, the things that it does. Well, come time for release. And when it's time for release, I take them back to the yard. You can see some old milkweed here. This is in the fall. I take them back to where I found them and, and let them go. Um, sometimes they will sit like this for a minute or two, exercising their wings before they leave. But this last year, this in 2021, I, I tagged and released 12 butterflies. And as soon as I went outside and opened my hands, they were gone. But this is what it, this is what it looks like here. This is about a minute video. <laughs> so I don't take them out and shush them. I let them do their own thing. They'll leave when it's time to leave. And they're so delicate that I could not feel them sitting on my finger. Isn't that neat? You hear those humans talking in the background there. Have no fear. Freedom is near. Ah, uh, good luck. Well, this again is the chrysalis that I showed you earlier. And I want to show you this again because some of the sources of mortality that I have observed in my yard, when I would find a chrysalis every now and then, this I might find it like this. It's been attacked by something. Uh, and something maybe trying to find a meal and realizing that it wasn't really good at all, but a source of mortality. And so I, there was one I found out in my yard. I brought it in late, late in the season. I already released all the butterflies, yet there was one left. So I brought it in, suspended it in my butterfly cage and watched it. And it was, it was a couple of weeks with nothing happening and it turned dark. And I thought, oh, it's turning dark. Maybe that's good. But turns out there were some threads hanging from it. This chrysalis had been attacked by a, a fly called a, a tachinid fly that is a predator on lots of different insects. And what it does is lays its egg uh, on the caterpillar or in the chrysalis, uh, and, and that kills it. And the, these threads are what the, the egg was hanging from, and the, drops, the egg dropped, dropped to the floor of my tent. And I found the, the, the dead chrysalis. I found this egg, which then hatched into this fly, which I captured so that I could photograph it. Another source of mortality. And this was yet another source that I saw. Here's that chrysalis and the tachinid fly egg. But this one, I was sitting out on my back deck and, and a, uh, um, a bird landed on the deck with this in its mouth. And it was trying to decide to eat it or not. And it kind of spit it out because it wasn't, wasn't, wasn't very tasty. But the bird didn't eat it, but it certainly killed it. So there's another source of mortality that I've seen uh, in my yard, natural mortality these butterflies but actually this is actually the one that it fell and i held it and put it back up until it had a good grip on the ceiling and i just left it there and it did quite well well thinking about all this oh, go back what can you and i do well we, there's actually several things we can do you've seen what, what i've tried to do and in, in, in with you know with my means but the planting and growing milkweed and the, the one that I'm using and the one that I would offer you if you want the seeds is the native plant. It, it's, it's what grows naturally in our area and in all of North America. It's the common milkweed. There are, there are many different species of milkweed and monarchs can, can actually utilize several different species. 
the most common one we have around here is the one that I've showed you. And uh, I've not yet created a Monarch way station that is um, with a, a place for water and, and enough of the different kind of flowers that they can get uh, nectar from when the adult mon monarchs are coming through uh, and laying eggs or when they're heading out going south. But I do have a, uh, a bird bath uh, in my backyard that the birds like. Uh, but when it's monarch season, in August and September and into October, I shut down my uh, uh, my bird feeders. I, I, I close them off and don't fill them, so the birds won't be attracted to my yard, which I really miss. But just just in the off chance they might try to eat my caterpillars or the or the the adults, so I don't do that. Uh, so I use the the the, uh, the the bird bath, and I'll put some flat stones in it and water, so the uh, butterflies can land on the stones and get a drink. So it's a watering station. Um, and then growing nectar flowers uh, to uh, offer as food source for the butterflies. Uh, and I, and one of the books I have here, I'll show you, is, is really, really very good for telling you about uh, what flowers and so forth. And raising monarchs in your home or school as appropriate. I um, mean, and, and uh, I have helped a couple of schools uh, in, in Montgomery County. Uh, last spring, one of the schools was forming a, uh, uh, a butterfly garden as, as a, an outdoor project during COVID time. And I know that the, the science teacher there, we partnered on some things over time. And, and I got to them some of my uh, milkweed seeds for their butterfly garden. And citizen science programs, I'm going to talk to you about one of those that I got involved with this last year. And when I'm doing all this, you know, as a, as a biologist, as a scientist, I don't trust this to remember things. So I keep a journal. I actually have my journal sitting right here in front of me. And it's, it's very numerous and all about all my notes of things that I'm doing as I go along and what I'm learning, what I'm seeing, just because. And one of the, of the nice things we can do also is when you're comfortable doing whatever you do for monarchs is tell your friends and help them to understand and help them to become a, uh, an advocate for, for monarchs and for, for environment. And then this, of course, this last piece is, is what I, I try hard to do, is to avoid all that. So uh, one of the citizen science programs I got involved with in 2021 was with this, this Monarch Watch uh, program that's run by the University of Kansas in Lawrence, in eastern Kansas, right there in the central flyway. They've been studying the migration of monarchs for many years, and they have a, a tagging program where you can help them tag butterflies that you have or that you've captured. And they have these little tiny tags. They come, they're little sticky tags. You unstick them and stick it on the wing of the butterfly. And I'll show you that. They're very tiny, about as big around as the eraser on a pencil. And they, this, this group here was a group of 25. I used 12 of them uh, last, last year. And this is what it looks like. This is a photo from, uh, from a book. It shows you the nice, tag on the butterfly. This is exactly the place to do it on this particular scale of the wing. And these are two of the ones that uh, we did uh, this, this past uh, fall, uh, tagging with the uh, monarchwatch.org tags. And whether we'll ever see a return from these is hard to say. The, uh, the science reports I've read and the books I've read about all this from Monarch Watch especially, is that their, their uh, tag returns are about uh, 1%. They've tagged about 2 million butterflies. They and people like me around the country doing this with them have tagged about 2 million, and their returns have been just shy of 2,000. So about 1%, not many. But 2,000 tag returns gives them a good idea uh, what, what's happened. So as I did this, I had to record uh, on their data sheet uh, the, the date when I, when I applied the tag, whether the butterfly was male or female. Um, the, the, the date, time, and, and then the, the date of when I released it. So if this tag comes back, someone finds this butterfly and this tag number comes back to the University of Kansas, they can look at their data, put all that data online on their database, and they can see that this tag, this butterfly was tagged in Rockville, Maryland in, in uh, October of 2021, and it was recovered wherever. And they can therefore look about, look and see where the migration route is, the timing of it, 
And uh, how neat would it be uh, for one of these to come back from Mexico? I'm not expecting that, you know, but there is, there, there is a tagging program here in several places uh, in uh, Maryland. And one of the places on the Patuxent River a few years ago had a tag return from one of their monarchs uh, in Mexico. How cool is that? Well, this is some of what I've, I've given to, uh, to Dottie, some, uh, some websites where you can go and get information um, about things happening locally in Maryland and, and nearby with monarchs and, and programs. And you can go to monarchwatch.org if you're interested in, in, in the learning from the experts, what's going on, and maybe even participating in their citizen science program. And I'm sorry for this, but I, I just had to do this. And that's me. Uh, if, uh, if you'd like to uh, make contact, if you're doing some stuff and you have some questions, you think I can help, I'd be glad to. That's my email, WhitneyLake1 at AOL. And this is uh, the Montgomery County Historical Society that is sponsoring what you're, what you're hearing tonight, which I do totally as a volunteer. I make nothing out of this, but good time. So that's Montgomery history. And I would uh, end it there. Stop the share and say to Dottie that uh, I'd be glad for uh, if we want to have some discussion or do some question and answer, I'll be glad to try. Yes, I will point out the links which he has mentioned. I sent to the same emails you use to register with. So if you can't find them, make sure to check your spam email. And if you still can't find them, you can always email info at polesvilleseniors.org and I can pass them to you from there. Um, I see a couple questions in the Zoom chat. I see people saying that they would be interested in some milkweed pods, so we will try and grab those and I will send an email when we get a hold of them so you can we can figure out a way to get them to you. Can you um, can I say Donnie for those who would like some milkweed seeds if they can either get that to you or to me how many people I'll actually create some little packets of seeds and, and a printed instruction on what to do and I'll send it to you. Sounds perfect. I'll, I'll give you a list of everyone who comments. So if you're interested in getting a milkweed pod, make sure to drop a comment in the chat so I can put you down for one. Um, I see that. Thank you for doing that. That says, what type of area should milkweed be planted in, full sun or partial sun? Yeah, like they typically like full sun. Uh, in, in the Midwest of the U.S., the main, the main thoroughfare for the migration is, is a lot of open fields and farms and prairies and meadows. So my yard, I have a couple of big maple trees, but there's a few spots where it's very sunny. And that's what they typically like. So if you have a, a really sunny spot in your yard, you might, you might uh, choose that. And the seeds sometimes take a while to Germany. When I first planted them, I was advised to plant them in the fall. Uh, you don't put them very deep, just lightly under the ground so they can get moist and get cold uh, and and they nothing came up the following spring and i thought well you know what did i do here it turned out the next spring a year and a half or so up they came and they've been taking over my yard ever since so what i've been doing or trying to do uh for for some of the folks is to get the, the seeds in the pods and to, to moisten them um with the like in a plastic bag with a wet paper towel and let them moist, put them in the refrigerator and let them be in there for a couple of months and then plant them. So when, when you get your seeds here this winter with, from Dottie, you might try doing that and then plant them in the springtime or start them inside. I know some of my friends have started them inside in pots like you do for your veggies, you know, on your grow lights. And that seemed to work also. I see another question in the chat that says, how do you tell a female butterfly from a male butterfly? That's a good question. There actually is a way to do that. I'm not sure if I have. I'm going to go back to my share for a minute. I don't think I have a good photo of that, but I'm going to go to this one here. Oops. That didn't work. Let's go back to the beginning. Try again. Okay, this is a female. The males have 
on on these on this the underwing here uh, have a, a, a large black pouch, one on each side, uh, that has to do with the reproduction and, and the uh, uh, hormones and things. So the, the, you can look at the man, you see there's a kind of a black spot here and a black spot over here along one of the veins. I think it's actually this, this inner vein here. And that's how you tell. That's the only way to tell the male and female. So you really kind of have to look carefully, look closely. The next question I see says, do monarchs who pass through central Maryland go to Mexico by staying very near the Atlantic coastline or further inland? I think from what I've read, uh, the more successful butterflies making it to Mexico are the ones who are more a little more inland and not necessarily right along the coast. Let me do this again. Maybe I should just stay here. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, I'll do this one here. You did again, didn't I? All right. But apparently the ones that are more inland are more successful. The ones along the coast, if they're really, really along the coast, I have to, to bridge some water. Some of these from Eastern Long Island, I was talking to my, my friend about that. And he said he thinks they do not go over the ocean to New Jersey. They probably kind of hover the coastline, but they do need to cross Delaware Bay. And Cape May, New Jersey, which is a great spot for bird watchers during the migration seasons, is also a great spot uh, for, uh, for monarchs. And it's, it's very seacoast there with pine trees. So they can, they can uh, roost at night, then fly over Delaware Bay and begin their, their trek down the coast. Some of them actually don't go to Mexico. They actually go into Florida for the, for the winter and then come back. But we do know that that one report I read talked about one of the monarchs tagged here in Maryland that was recovered in Mexico. So it can happen. I see another comment that says, I have a large patch of milkweed in my backyard, but have only seen tussock moths, no monarchs. Really? Very interesting. Uh, is this in Poolsville? This person live in Poolsville? Or are they somewhere here in Montgomery County? Feel free to unmute if you want to elaborate on your question. Well, I would say uh, I, I see lots of uh, caterpillars too in, in, in my yard. No, caterpillars are one of the prime food sources uh, for birds uh, who, are, who have a nest of, of uh, young and are very busy uh, foraging and feeding them. Caterpillars are one of the main sources of food for young birds. So if you've yeah. got some tussock moth caterpillars, that may be a good thing for the birds. I, I uh, put that in, I'm in Dickerson. Okay. And I actually have seen three or four monarch caterpillars. I've never seen any of the, any of the chrysalides or anything like that, hmm. but I have actually seen some of the caterpillars, but yeah. not on this gigantic patch of milkweed that I have in my backyard. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and for me, the, 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 the adult, adult monarchs coming through and laying, laying eggs is spotty. And if I happen to be watching or happen to be in the backyard, I see them. But all those other times, no. Uh, and I'll see, like you, I'll see uh, uh, see caterpillars now and then. Uh, so I would say that if you've got milk feeding and, you, and you've had caterpillars, you know, you're you're doing a good thing there. And uh, you know, let let them do whatever they can do. <laughs> give them a, give them a helping hand. Have you seen your milkweed try to take over the space? Oh, absolutely. I've had to dig it back out of my lawn, cut it back. It, it's very invasive mm -hmm. once it goes and it does not take long to go. Yeah, they get these roots that go down and then spread sideways laterally right. and those shoots will come up. And they're, they're yeah, they're, you really have to have to monitor it. If you like milkweed, let them go, you know. But right. well, I, have a lot of, I have a lot of milkweed in my fields also. Oh. Um, and that's actually where I've kind of caught a couple of the caterpillars when I've been going through the field, I see them crawling on the milkweed leaves in the field. But oh. I haven't seen them on this gigantic bunch that I have in my yard. It's just been, it's been in, in just totally covered in the tussock moths. I mean, hmm. like 
they, I go out one day and like all of a sudden it's like this one entire milkweed is gone and there's like hundreds of the tussock moths on it. Wow. Have you seen the, the adult from the tussock moth? The no, that I haven't. I've only seen the moths. I haven't seen anything else. Okay. You know, the caterpillars. Are your, are your milkweeds in the full sun? Yes. Outside? Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Someone was asking about that and that seems to be where they really thrive. Yeah. And I don't water them. <laughs> no, outside you don't need to. That's right. <laughs> Let nature take care of that. The next question I see says, are there any recommended companion plants to plant near milkweed to protect caterpillars when they leave the birth plant? Big leaved plants like sunflower or pumpkins. When the caterpillars leave the milkweed to find a suitable place to attach their chrysalis, um, I'm not sure that any particular plant is better than another, but I think oftentimes they'll look uh, look for a, like a, a tree or some some wood. I find you know unlike on the underside of my back deck, the wooden deck, they climb there and and, the, and attach there just like the cicadas did all last springtime. Um, so they're looking for some good hard substrate, the kind of flowers that would be helpful to the adult butterflies, either those coming through to lay the eggs, or perhaps when uh, you release your butterfly, are the kind of flowers that are, are, are good for, for nectar and pollen, uh, prairie type flowers and other things. Let me show you a couple of things here. Um, and, and these are part of what uh, Dottie will send you. This is the, the, the greatest book ever. And this is, this is a book written by a person who was a journalist and a uh, citizen scientist writing just about everything you want to know about monarchs in a way that's very easy to understand, including how you can make your garden monarch friendly, what kind of flowers to plant for food sources and other things. And I got this on the, at Amazon, where we get everything these days. And then another one I recently got is this one, family butterfly book. It's got all these 40 different species of butterflies, but there's also a good bit of information there on monarchs as well. And that's on the list that you'll get. And the one that I really want to show you is the one that was granddaughter approved. Mr. McGinty's Monarchs. It's about this, this man who's walking through the neighborhood and he sees that the monarch caterpillars are having a hard time and he decides he's going to do what I did. Or maybe I did what he did. However you want to look at this. And he brings the monarchs inside and puts them into these big tanks and feeds them the milkweed and all that. And at the end, then what he does, he's get, he has all these containers of, of caterpillars, many of them, and he takes them to the local elementary school and he gives one to each class. And each class then is responsible for rearing those. And when it came time, Mr. McKinty and all the kids went outside and opened their tanks and all these butterflies went out. It's, it's really a neat, a neat story. And when my granddaughter gave me this, she said, Grandpa, you're gonna love this book. So it's grandchild approved and I recommend it. I see a question that says, what species of milkweed do you recommend? Well, the only one I have used so far is the common milkweed. Uh, let's see here. The one that I showed you in all those. I'm just turning to my book here just because it's it's the common the common milkweed, which you can you can, actually you can buy it in the uh, outdoor stores. You know where you where you buy your plants and veggies and gardens and things. Sometimes uh, they'll they'll be selling and they may have a couple different species of milkweeds. But I, I I would just go with the common milkweed because I know it's a native plant. You're not introducing something from somewhere else, and and, and I feel more comfortable with that. And I've had good success. The uh, the caterpillars really like the common milkweed. That's that's the that's the official name of it. 
I see Denise pointed out in the chat, maybe the Poolsville Seniors Pass program on native plantings would also help with milkweed plantings. Uh, if you check out our YouTube, we've got a couple of videos about um, native gardening and there's one by Lauren Hubbard, Jump on the Butterfly Bandwagon, and she talks a little bit more about planting specific. What's that source again? I'm writing this down. It's your YouTube? Yes, our Poolsville Seniors YouTube. Okay. And there's a specific video, Jump on the Butterfly Bandwagon with Lauren Hubbard. All right. Thank you. And then I see a question from Tookie saying, how long do adult monarchs live? Do they do more than one migration? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question because it's, it's, it's very varied. The, uh, the monarchs that are leaving Mexico and flying north in the spring and summer, they will live from uh, two to six weeks. And they are the ones that are stopping four or five times different generations along the way laying eggs to produce the next adult that'll fly the next leg of the trip. Uh, so they, they don't live that long. However, the uh, monarch that is reared in the fall, like the ones that I'm doing, that are, are, are born in the, in the late summer and early fall, they are the monarch that flies all the way to Mexico, 2,000 or 2,800 miles, whatever it is, that animal when it hatches, unlike the ones, the ones flying north are all sexually mature, capable of reproducing. This one that's heading south uh, is not sexually mature. All of the energy for this butterfly is going into the flight and, and the energy to get, get home. So it goes all the way to Mexico and it, it will live for six or eight months. So and what, assuming it, it uh, gets home to central Mexico, it will then overwinter there uh, and in the springtime, in March or so, it will then uh, head north and become part of, part of that first group to reproduce. So it, it is the magnificent butterfly. It flies all the way home and then begins the, the trip back north again. Yeah, that's the one that lives the longest. So I'm hopeful that I've been able to help a few do that, but hey, we'll see. <laughs> I see a question that says, are you focused on monarchs or do you also raise other species like the spice bush swallowtail? No, I haven't done any of those. Although I, I will see sometimes in our veggie garden uh, on some of the, the herbs uh, is where the swallowtails, uh, like the, the, uh, uh, the, the caterpillars, like some of the herbal things we grow. And I just, just let them be, you know, I don't mess with them. Uh, no, but monarchs is the only thing I have focused on here. Uh, I I can't branch out too more too much more than that I guess. But last last spring, 2021, uh, I got very busy uh, monitoring and studying and photographing the 17 year cicadas in my backyard. I had just a great time with that. And I also have a, a, a PowerPoint on the cicadas. If you might get interested in that sometime, we could do that to show you their life cycle and and uh, what I've learned by watching them in my backyard. Forty thousand in my backyard, maybe. Yeah, and if I have a little back, I have a little, a little backyard, and if you scale that up, uh, I, you know, just roughly, I scaled that up to an acre, and that, and that would, scales up to be about, about 500,000, about half a million per acre last spring. Now that's, you know, scaled up, estimate. But That's these, a lot. <laughs> as you may have seen, there were a lot of cicadas, at least in this part of the county. Do we have any more questions? Feel free to send any last questions in the chat or feel free to unmute and ask any last questions. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's my pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you for asking. I think it was just an awesome educational program but the photography that you had with it oh yeah just was unbelievable to be able to see the process thank you I, I, thanks very much for that it was my cell phone you know you too can do that it takes <laughs> take a little patience that's amazing <laughs> it's the right place at the right time right great presentation thank oh, you thank very you good. fascinating thank you yeah. so much my pleasure <clears throat>
We'd nice love to have you back. Yes. I, Loved I do, it. I do have one quick question. Yeah. When should I go out and look on the leaves for the eggs in this area? In my yard uh, here in, uh, in Rockville, it was late August yeah. okay. when I saw, oh, actually, I saw butterfly, monarchs coming through here in June. They were probably heading north. Mm -hmm. But the ones that were flying south laying the eggs, it was like the last week in August and into early September. Okay. When I saw them actually laying eggs on the, on the milkweed. On the milkweed. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And as always, if you have any questions later, you can email info at poolsvilleseniors.org and we can pass on your questions for you. Keep an eye on your email. We'll get you more info about getting the milkweed pods if you commented that you're interested. And I also put a link in the chat to our YouTube, which you can check out the butterfly bandwagon video and this presentation has also been recorded and will be posted to our YouTube by this weekend. I would just like to say, I hope you all enjoyed tonight's program as much as I did and learned something new. Um, you can always email us later at info at poolsvilleseniors.org and find anything Poolsville Seniors related at www.poolsvilleseniors.org. If you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera to say goodbye, now is the time. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and a comment. We'd like to thank Clarence for this presentation as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors because we love putting on these programs for you. If you enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events We'll be back this time next week with Kenny Scholl's first historic properties lecture of 2022. So we hope to see you there. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.